Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to Tuesday Night Teaching. Uh, this is our weekly Bible study. Uh, thank you so much for sharing this time with us. I would ask that whichever platform you may be watching the service from, perhaps you're on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, um, but I would encourage you to retweet this post, share this post, particularly if you're on Facebook, um, to those who are on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to our channel. Um, you can receive notifications as to when we're going live. Um, you can also find archived there uh, some of our previous studies and our worship services. Um, but again, we're grateful to have you with us. I want to thank also to our incredible team um, that is so faithful and dedicated and competent. Uh, grateful for them uh, as we uh, spread this service um, across various platforms. This year, uh, the, the teaching series we've been in, um, I've entitled Back to Basics, Essential Components of Christian Life. In the end of last year, um, I was praying as it relates to which direction the Lord would have me to go. And what was placed upon my heart is to just do a series on Back to Basics. And let's return to, and, and have some conversation about some of the essential components of Christian life. Uh, because what can happen over time is, particularly in church life, is that we get to a place where um, I think we're just going through the motions and we can lose sight and sensitivity uh, as it relates to what our, as it relates to the inner reality and why it is we're doing what we do. And the, and the Lord cares, the Lord cares not only about what we do, but why it is we do what we do. And so I wanted to revisit uh, what have been some of these classic um, teachings um, of Christianity. Um, and for this, we turn to uh, two texts in particular, uh, one text being Richard Foster's Celebration of Discipline. And we're going to be moving into that um, a little bit more tonight. Um, but the other text would have been a book by Rowan Williams, um, just entitled On Being Christian. And so in January, we talked about uh, baptism, of course, and used that. Uh, we had that study on Remember Your Baptism. Um, baptism is something that goes all the way back uh, to the time of Jesus. Jesus himself was baptized, and it actually predates Jesus. Um, but certainly we, as for Christians, we trace it back to Jesus when he himself um, was baptized by his cousin John. And the skies were torn apart. The spirit descended on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven was heard saying, Behold, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. And so we talked about baptism, and of course, uh, baptism not being a requirement of salvation, uh, but being a requirement of obedience. Why do we get baptized? We get baptized because the Bible tells us to. Um, even as far back as the book of Acts, when we read about the birth of the church and Peter preaching his first sermon, uh, the Bible says they heard Peter share these words and they were cut to the heart. And they asked, so what then shall we do? And Peter says to them, repent and be baptized. Uh, so we talked about baptism. We talked about uh, the Bible, right? These 66 books um, that are uh, breathed on or inspired by God, uh, these sacred scriptures, uh, the uniqueness of um, this book as it relates to inspiration and informing um, our faith. Uh, we talked also about the Eucharist, also known as communion, and uh, what's happening when we gather around the Lord's table uh, to reenact um, the Lord's Supper. Uh, the, those elements of bread and um, juice or wine, uh, what it is they point to. As I shared, communion is not a reward for a select few, uh, those who have lived so remarkably uh, that we're now somehow worthy uh, to uh, partake of these elements, um, but, it's, but it's all about Christ, uh, his life, his suffering, his sacrifice, and us being made worthy um, by his righteousness. And so we talked again about communion, and then we talked about prayer. Um, and prayer, I wanna submit to us, is not only um, a, an essential component of Christianity, uh, but it's also a central practice. And we're going to move now and begin to have some conversation about what are some of the central practices of our faith. Um, I would be remiss um, not to mention that, of course, uh, February 14th, 
uh, tomorrow is Ash Wednesday. And Ash Wednesday kicks off the season of Lent. And Lent is the period in between Ash Wednesday and Easter. If you're looking at a calendar, um, it should be 40 days. Um, and that number 40 in the Bible is full of meaning and significance as well. Uh, but 40 days, uh, that period um, in between Ash Wednesday and Easter Sunday. And um, it's a time where it's called Lent. And it's a time, uh, 40 days, not counting Sundays, um, but it's a time where uh, Christians have historically and traditionally, uh, it's been a time of fasting. It's a time where people will give up certain things. And it's interesting, <laughs> even those who are not especially religious uh, will practice the Lenten fast. Um, and so, but it's a time where we give up certain things. Um, but then also um, Lent is a time where we give into um, more deeper, more intentional, more fervent, uh, practicing our spiritual devotions. And um, I'll be talking uh, tonight and the next few weeks about what those things are. So I would invite you to join us tomorrow uh, here at the church in the sanctuary for our Ash Wednesday service. We're going to start that at 12 noon um, and it'll run for, uh, I suspect, uh, 45 minutes or so. I certainly want to be out within an hour, um, but I'm encouraging you to come and share with us for our Ash Wednesday service. Uh, we'll, there'll be uh, singing, I'll offer a meditation, praying, uh, but also there'll be the imposition of the ashes. Um, this is when you'll have an opportunity to come and receive uh, the mark on your forehead um, that is um, basically uh, the ashes um, that again, we, we, we're being marked off and we are remembering the fact that from dust we came, from dust we shall return, our mortality um, and our human frailty and our dependence on God. All right, so you can come and receive ashes, uh, be a part of the Ash Wednesday service. And that's going to kill off the season of Lent. And then Lent, of course, is going to take us up to Easter. And Easter this year um, is the last Sunday in March. Um, so um, this is a high and holy time, as <laughs> they used to say at my uh, divinity school. It's a high and holy time. And um, I love this season because it really puts us back in touch and in tune uh, with our faith, uh, with what it is we believe, um, and then also with the sacrifice uh, that Jesus made for us. Uh, we'll talk more about this in the weeks ahead, but you know, one of the reasons this Lent is 40 days um, and the reason we're fasting for 40 days is because we're mirroring um, what Jesus did after Jesus' baptism. Uh, the Bible says he was led into the spirit whereby he was tempted for 40 days uh, by the devil. And after which, of course, that's when Satan comes and says to him, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. So 40 uh, typifies a time period of testing. Um, and um, Jesus, of course, uh, fasted for those 40 days. And um, that's why um, Lent is 40 days as well. All right. So um, again, we're going to be moving now. We talked about central practices or components of Christian life. We're now going to be talking about central spiritual practices, central spiritual practices. And tonight, um, our topic, of course, is meditation, Christian meditation. Uh, before we go a little bit deeper, join me, if you would, for a word of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for this time that is ours uh, to listen and to learn more about your word. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but your word shall not pass away. We pray, God, that you bless us, be with us in a special way on tonight. Allow us, God, to share your word with clarity. Uh, remove, God, any distraction, anything that's not like you. Allow us, God, to hear uh, what it is you're saying to the church. We want to be not only hearers of your word, but we want to be doers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So we're talking about meditation, which Richard Foster also refers to as contemplative prayer. Meditation, Christian meditation, uh, but he also refers to it as contemplative prayer. I want to anchor um, our conversation tonight in several scriptures. Uh, so let's just uh, turn here to some of these scriptures. Um, and we'll go from there. The first one, Old Testament book of Joshua, chapter number one, verse number eight. Joshua chapter number one, verse number eight. There we find these words. 
this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. It says, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to act in accordance with all that is written in it. For then you shall make your way prosperous and then you shall have success. And this is powerful because uh, this, of course, is God's word to Joshua. Joshua being the successor to Moses. Moses led the people out of Egypt, through the wilderness, up to the promised land. But Joshua would be the one to actually lead them into the promised land. Moses um, died and was buried by God, the Bible says, um, on Mount Nebo. He got a chance to peep over and see the promised land, uh, but he did not enter the land himself. Uh, the lot, uh, that lot, uh, that mantle, if you would, fell to Joshua. Joshua is, would have been uh, Moses's minister, the King James Bible calls him, Moses's uh, servant. He, along with Caleb, uh, they are ones who entered the promised land uh, of that generation. But here it is. I mean, we're talking about Moses next to God, Jesus and David. No name is mentioned in the Bible more than Moses. Moses was the Hebrew leader, liberator and lawgiver. Moses is the one who actually uh, got to see God um, in a sense. The Bible talks about him being uh, hidden in the cleft of a rock and God passed by and he was allowed to get a, a glimpse, if you would, of the glory of God. Moses is the one who went up on Mount Sinai twice, spent 40 days and 40 nights fasting in the presence of God, receiving the commandments. Um, so, you know, Moses was a consequential figure. The first five books of the Bible are referred to as the books of Moses. All right. The law came through Moses. And so um, the lot of leadership and that mantle falls down to Joshua and hear what the Lord says to him. And that's, that's what makes the scripture so powerful, because, of course, you know, Joshua has to be thinking, how then do I lead uh, such a large body? Um, how then do I follow someone as consequential and impactful as Moses? And notice what God tells him again, Joshua chapter one, verse number eight, this book of the law, he gives them the law. Don't let the part out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Be careful to act in accordance with it. All this written in it for then you shall make your way prosperous and you will have success. So God gives them basically his words, his law and says, meditate on this. Hold on to this and uh, you will have success. Another scripture I want to look at comes from Psalm 19, verse number four. And uh, I, it's often a part of my prayer uh, before preaching. It's a popular hymn choir song. It's something we say so much in the church. Uh, some people probably or perhaps uh, don't realize that this is directly from scripture. Psalm 19 and 14, it says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. All right, so that's Psalm number 19, uh, verse number four. And then the third scripture reference I want to offer us, and I love this one. Um, it's one that I think is, it behooves us to record to memory. If you're talking about a scripture to really meditate on. To, because let me hasten to say, and we're going to be talking about meditation tonight. One of the things that separates you know, Christian meditation from Eastern forms and traditions of meditation is that um, in Eastern traditions, uh, meditation in the secular sense is about being emptied, all right? But in Christian tradition, when we talk about meditation, we're talking about being filled, being filled with thoughts about God, being filled with God's word, being filled, all right? Being occupied with who God is. And so uh, we're encouraged to do this. Paul says in Philippians chapter four, verse number eight. And again, this is one of my favorites. Um, I had my children record this to memory as well, too. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence and if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. All right. I um, mean, again, that's Philippians chapter four, verse number eight. So in this book, uh, The Celebration of Discipline, Richard Foster says that um, in contemporary society, 
our adversary majors in three things. He says noise, hurry, and crowds. Uh, but I want to add to that. I want to add one to that tonight. And I would <laughs> um, suggest that one of our major adversaries in contemporary society is distractions. Weapons, if you would, of mass distraction. All right. Um, and I really think we uh, deal with this because we're just so stimulated all the time. Our attention spans are so short these days, right? You know, um, we are always on some device, on some phone. Uh, we have so much access to information all the time that, you know, we just have, and I'm a product of it, just having a shorter attention span and now uh, we so easily become distracted. And here's how I want to define distraction. Distraction is anything that draws our attention away from God or impedes on our focus on spiritual matters. Anything, church, that draws our attention away from God or impedes our focus on spiritual matters. <laughs> so, um, for, and what this then means is that different things can become a, a distraction to different people. Different things can become a distraction to different people. Constant distractions is problematic because number one, it can impede on deep reflection and self-discovery. And these are crucial for spiritual growth. If we're gonna grow spiritually, <laughs> Um, then it necessitates deep reflection and some self-discovery if we are to grow. But constant distractions impede on these things. Here's the second thing I want to say, and that is that distractions can lead us from spiritual practices, prioritizing the fleeting pleasures or obligations over our nurturing over um, nurturing our well-being. Part of what we have to be intentional about as Christians believers is taking the time to do the things that nurture us spiritually. And again, it's just so easy to become distracted. Um, and so in a Christian context, again, meditation uh, can be described as a serene and focused communion with God. I wanna call this contemplative prayer. Isaiah, I love the scripture, Isaiah 26 and verse number three, it captures this, the essence of what we're talking about. It says, thou will keep in peace those whose minds are stayed on thee. That's the King James, the New Revised Standard Version says it like this, those of steadfast mind, you will keep in peace because they trust you. So biblically, meditation encompasses, it encompasses various practices, all aimed at deepening our relationship with God. So let's talk about what meditation looks like for us as believers. For one, it is active listening to God's word. Active listening to God's word. So, you know, pausing, sometimes taking time to, 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 to reflect on and try to get a sense of what is God saying to me, particularly through God's word. There's a practice um, called uh, Lectio Divina um, that involves really slowly reading God's word because you're trying to absorb it. You're trying to hear what is God singing to me. We start talking about meditation and some of these spiritual disciplines will be tying in tonight, like certainly um, it's hard to have a conversation about meditation without, so, without also talking about study and studying of our Bible, the Bible being an essential component of Christianity. But when you're talking about meditating and absorbing God's word in that way, we're doing it not so much for breath, but for depth. All right. You read the Bible in its entirety for depth, but you study for breath, but you study and you meditate for depth. It's an opportunity to go deeper. 
So um, meditation involves intentively listening to God's word, <laughs> not uh, because, you know, we're trying to exegete it um, or not because we're necessarily trying to analyze it um, or critique it, but because we're trying to absorb it. All right. So actively listening to God's word. Is that not what the Bible is about? It's full of stories of people who um, heard from God and acted and responded accordingly. Well, guess what? God is still speaking. And one of the ways that God speaks to us um, is through his God's word in general. But how God speaks to us is through his son, Jesus Christ, in particular. So actively listening to God's word. And then here's something else I want to say that biblical meditation um, involves, and that is contemplating God's works. Contemplating God's works, God's act um, throughout history and time. And again, this is where the Bible helps us to, um, to think about uh, Jesus and who he is and his, uh, the, and his incarnation right? His, his life, uh, the ministry of Jesus, the things that Jesus taught, but then also the things that Jesus did, and certainly the work of Jesus Christ in terms of his salvific, redemptive death on the cross. And the reality of death would not be the end of the story, but then also the resurrection. And then even after the resurrection, his ascension back to God, where he's seated on the right hand of the Father, and then to go even further, God's his sending of the Holy Spirit, the helper, the paraclete, uh, sending of the Holy Spirit um, into this world and particularly into the church um, and energizing us um, to continue Christ's work. So, you know, what we, when we're talking about meditation, we are also contemplating God's work. So thinking about what is God has done for us in Jesus Christ. But then also to how have you seen God working and moving in your life? And I bring back a quote. I bring up a quote I use often. Uh, Seren Kierkegaard says that life is lived uh, forward, but learns backwards. So which is to say, you know, time is only moving in one direction. Um, but there's some value in looking back. If you're walking in the snow, you can tell the progress you made by looking back at the tracks. And sometimes as we look back, we can see how the hand of God has been moving and working in our lives. All right. So part of meditation involves contemplating God's works, God's works in scripture, God's works throughout history, but then also God's works throughout our lives. You know, I, I have had some instances and some occasions in my life where the Lord has moved in such a way to where I just know this was God. And these are things that we ought to think on. These are things uh, that we ought to meditate on. Um, here's something else closely tied to what I just said. Um, meditation involves recalling God's faithfulness. Think about the myriad of ways in which God has been faithful to us. And lastly, pondering God's teachings. Right. So when you're talking about and I referenced the scripture earlier, um, anytime you, you see that word in the Bible, the law, um, the law can also be translated. That word there can also be translated as teaching. What? is what has been, what is God's teaching? Uh, that's something else that we uh, must take seriously too. Again, not because we're trying to analyze it, but, we, but because we're trying to absorb it. And meditation is a pathway towards us really absorbing God's word. All right, so each of these facets um, underscores the transformative power of us encountering God, right? So all of these this uh, spiritual practices that we're talking about, but particularly meditation, it's about us encountering God. And it's important uh, for us to recognize and to understand that the purpose of God's presence in our lives is not just to make us feel good. <laughs> That's one of the things I find almost in contradiction seemingly with the modern church versus, you know, with the witness of scripture. And that is, you know, when the Lord shows up, it's not just always to make us feel good. It's not just always to give us warm and fuzzy feelings, but it's to change us. It's to transform us. Amen. 
is to transform us. So moving us beyond emotional comfort. The presence of God seeks to affect profound changes within us. And I like it. So uh, Foster, uh, he emphasized that Christian meditation includes filling the mind with God's truth and dwelling deeply on it. As I stated earlier, in contrast to the Eastern thought on meditation, look, it's not about just emptying the mind, but rather being filled with scripture, being filled with truth and um, and indeed encountering God, being filled um, by the presence of God. And so through meditation, we open ourselves. We open ourselves uh, to the possibility of growth, renewal and alignment with God's will. As we meditate on God's truths and seek God's presence, we are called to embrace a life characterized by obedience, by love and by service. So again, meditation helps us to really prepare ourselves to go out and live the kind of life um, that God would have us to live. And what kind of life does, would God have us to live? One is characterized by obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice. That great hymn of the church says, trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. So our lives as Christians must be um, 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 characterized by obedience. The Bible is constantly saying, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Hear ye the word of the Lord. In the biblical context, hearing and heeding go hand in hand. So our life must be, uh, 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 must be characterized by obedience and then also by love. What did Jesus say uh, to disciples in John's gospel, chapter number 13, uh, at the last supper? I give you a new commandment that you love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. So our lives must be characterized by obedience, by love, but then also by service. In the New Testament, that word, the Greek word for service can also be translated as ministry. Uh, they are closely aligned. That's what ministry is about. Ministry is about serving. Jesus even says, for the Son of Man came not to be served, thank you, uh, but to serve and to offer his life as a ransom for many. And so thus, and we're going to put this on the screen, hear me tonight when I say meditation is not only a way to experience peace, but also a path to personal transformation and spiritual growth. It's not just a way to experience peace, although I think that's part of it, because he said peace he give to those whose minds have stayed on him, um, but then also it's a path towards personal transformation and spiritual growth. And so I hope that we'll be real intentional um, about taking the time that we need to meditate. And I hope also too, and that you'll continue to stay with me um, as, we, as we talk about all these Christian practices, because what I hope um, we can get to a place of is having good balance when it comes to these things. But what we're starting with tonight, again, is meditation. I wanna say um, three things about the forms of meditation, and uh, that will be our time for tonight. Here's number one, meditation upon scriptures. As I stated earlier, it's not about exegesis, <laughs> but we meditate on scriptures to internalize them. And so practically, this could involve uh, reading a passage of scripture very slowly, repeatedly, recording it to memory, um, pondering its message, praying over it, and allowing its truths to shape your thoughts, shape your attitude, and ultimately shape your actions. So we're meditating upon the scriptures, all right? Um, and so let's, um, let's engage this tonight. Let's think about our one simple verse uh, that most persons should know, uh, Matthew chapter six, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to us. Notice that passage comes on the heels of Jesus talking about how, you know, believers uh, should not worry. Certainly we should not be um, worried in the sense of we're just oppressed and consumed by it. 
because our Father who is in heaven will take care of us. And he closes this particular part of the Sermon on the Mount um, on saying to us, but seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to us. That's a great verse to meditate on. So for you, what are these things? These things that the Lord said he would add that we often allow to get in the way of our commitment and our, our striving for the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. It's a great verse of scripture to really just ponder on, to meditate on. With the goal being not just so, you know, uh, I can quote a bunch of scriptures, um, but because I want the words of Jesus to shape my thoughts, shape my attitude, and then, of course, also my actions, right? Because before we can have orthopraxy, which is right practice, we have to have orthodoxy, which is right thinking. All right. So, you know, yeah, uh, it's been said our attitude will determine our altitude. Uh, some of us uh, struggle to live in um, this abundant life that Jesus said he would give because, you know, too often our attitudes are warped. Uh, too often uh, we are consumed uh, with negativity and toxicity. All right. But again, meditating on scriptures, it's not about so that I can exegete it or quote it, but it's because I want to internalize this. I want it to shape my thoughts, attitude, and actions. All right, so that's one thing I talk a lot about that, meditating upon scriptures. Here's number two tonight. How about meditating upon the creation? So Psalm 19, which I've already alluded to um, earlier tonight, uh, verse number four there, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Uh, that is very frequently, quite often, a part of my prayer. But, I, but hear how Psalm 19 starts off. As we're talking about, we can meditate upon creation. Hear this, Psalm 19 says, the heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. All right, so, here we're talking about, you know, the heavens, how this word is being used here in the psalmist and this poetic language. Heavens would be the skies and the, the, the firmament would refer to the atmosphere. So here we're talking about creation. We're talking about nature. Psalm 91 tells us again, the heavens are telling of the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. By meditating upon the beauty, the complexity and the order of the natural world. Believers can gain insight into the character and purposes of God. If you ever do any reading or research um, on Revelation in terms of not the book, but this whole theological idea of God revealing God's self to the world, um, oftentimes uh, what you'll, you'll find um, it'll be broken into categories of what they call general revelation and then special revelation. So some special and unique ways that God reveals God's self to us. But general revelation is to say these are the ways that God works and what God has done that just any and everybody ought to be able to see. All right, certainly, you know, there are unique ways that God speaks to us, but there are just some general ways um, that really ought to just point us uh, to the reality of who God is. And when you're talking about general revelation, uh, one of the things that you'll um, this often gets discussed and talked about is just consider nature, right? Uh, like, you know, there, there, it, there has to be, um, <laughs> there has to be a God somewhere. When you just think about the, uh, how, um, just how God has ordered and created the world, even just earth, for example, of how it, you know, spins on its axis around the sun and we have seasons that change and, and we have rain that, um, that, that is needed and necessary, right? Can't live without water and how uh, even in the earth spinning on its axis, it doesn't spin so quickly uh, that we get dizzy, but it doesn't spin so slowly that we fall off. Because uh, contrary to some uh, <laughs> conspiracy theorists, the earth really is round, right? You know, not flat, uh, it's round, 
We know this and we don't fall off. Why? Because of gravity, the gravitational pull. And, you know, there's so many things that, that, that we can put a, even a scientific definition on. But as for believers, we ought to be able to look at these things and say our God is awesome. When you just think about even how God has ordered and structured the world. So that's something to think about and to consider. You know, I'm, I'm, I can't wait for days to get longer and for the weather to get a little bit warmer. Uh, it's been my custom lately, myself and my daughter, we get up and walk in the morning and, um, I, I, and I love walking and I just like it a little bit better when it's above 40 degrees. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I love walking. I love just taking in nature, breathing fresh air, you know, seeing the sunrise, um, you know, listening to the chirping of, nat of birds, hearing nature. You know, for me, all of it just points me back to God. Uh, the one I believe a quietness calls the unmoved mover. Um, this God that's behind the universe um, that created it all, right? The Bible tells us the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. So, you know, Psalm is, Psalms affirm this in multiple places how this idea of God being our creator. And so by looking at creation, it points us back to the creator, right? And so that's something. So in that sense, meditating on creation, um, is, is a form of meditation as well. Thirdly, um, and finally tonight, um, meditating upon the events of our time and seeking to perceive their significance. This form of meditation involves reflecting on current events, and there are many, social trends and global issues through the lens of faith. You know, it's not... I want to have a long conversation about this tonight, but there are parts in the New Testament in particular, you know, where Jesus um, uses a lot of apocalyptic language. And by that, I mean talking about the end of time and, you know, and all the things we can anticipate and all the things we can expect. And you don't have to look too far or read too much in the news to see like, man, some of the things that Jesus, um, um, the, some of the things that Jesus, you know, t said would happen um, are actually happening. But through meditation, what we discover is that it's not a sign that everything is going wrong. It's a sign that everything's going right. Because, you know, if that's true, what's also true <laughs> is that um, God is in control and that God can use that which God did not cause, not only for our good, but for God's glory. So, again, paying attention, I got you to the world that's around us, the social trends, the global issues, looking through the lens of faith, right? Because, you know, one thing as, as ministers and pastors, we're in the, uh, we are in the, uh, the business of dealing hope. Hear me clearly, I didn't say dope, I said hope, right? So for, for pastors and for churches, uh, we, should, uh, we should be able to bring some perspective to these things and let people know, like, you look, be reminded, let people know God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and a sound mind. You know, Lynn, this is why I was kind of troubled the other week. We were at an event and um, we were talking about the crisis, the housing crisis, what's kind of what's going on in our city. It's not unique to our city, but just how difficult it is for people to make it and maintain these days and these tough economic times. And we're talking about, you know, disparities and and systemic issues that have further exasperated um, some of these inequalities. And, you know, um, there was one particular person who was just like, well, it's just ain't nothing we can do. We just, it's just nothing we can do. And I'm just like, well, dang, what, I mean, what, <laughs> what, are, we, what are we even here for then? I mean, like, you know, I, get, I thought, you know, soldiers of the cross, we ought to have something to say to give some hope, to give some inspiration. Amen, somebody. All right, you know, looking at these things through the lens of faith. You know, if I just wanted to be depressed, um, I could just, you know, <laughs> stay on social media all day or just read the news. Um, but, you know, but, but the gospel, right, quite literally means good news. The church and uh, uh, the church, we ought to have something to say. And we ought to be able to see the significance of the social trends and societal changes and what's going on. We ought to be able to see that through a lens of faith so that we can discern the deeper spiritual significance and implications. Amen? Amen. So Christian meditation is not about, again, emptying your mind, but it's about filling your mind with thoughts about God. A mind that's overwhelmed and fragmented by external affairs is not prepared to meditate. A mind, church, that's overwhelmed and fragmented by external affairs is not prepared to meditate. 
Notice what the Bible says. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, what mind, soul and strength. So part of loving God, uh, we do so cognitively. We do it with our minds. And, you know, uh, one of the ways we can we can kind of clear a path to be able to love God with our minds is through meditation. And meditation is us being occupied with thoughts about God, thoughts about scripture and God's word, you know, thoughts about God as creator. You know, we are God's creation and we ought to be able to look at creation and it point us back to our creator. And then also even seeing the significance of events and happenings that are going on around us through a lens of faith. Amen. I, I love that old uh, gospel song that says, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on the Lord. Amen. So that's meditation. Uh, come back and join us uh, next week. We're going to be talking about uh, prayer and fasting, prayer uh, and fasting, fasting um, in particular, as we are getting ready to enter Lent, which is a season of fasting. Uh, one more time, in case you get on late, I want to extend a, an invitation to you to join us tomorrow, Wednesday, 12 noon he, uh, at, here at our sanctuary. Uh, it'll be virtual, but you need to be in person if you're going to receive the imposition of ashes um, at 12 noon. I want you to be a part of our Ash Wednesday service um, as we have prayer um, going into the season of Lent. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I really appreciate your prayers and your presence uh, virtually. Uh, you can always reach out to me with questions, comments, or concerns. My email is tfarrow at readerministries.org. And also I would ask you to please prayerfully consider what the Lord would have you to give uh, tonight, what the Lord would have you to give. Giving is another spiritual practice. Um, and the Bible tells us um, that as we give, it'll be given back to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. So you can support the church through your giving. Uh, we have there the ways in which you can give on our screen. Any way you choose to be a blessing to this ministry, whether it's by mail, text, giving online, we will. Before we go, join me for a word of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for this time that's been ours to listen and learn more about your word and to talk particularly about the spiritual practice of meditating. Help us, Lord, in the busyness of our lives and in the hustle and bustle of our existential existence in the grind of just living day to day with shorter attention spans and so many distractions. Help us, God, to find space, to be intentional about carving out room, to just meditate on you and to fill our minds with thoughts about you. And as we do so, God, we're praying for peace. Peace you said you give to those whose minds were stayed on you. You, God, are our peace. Even in the midst of chaos, even in the midst of so much that's going on in our world, you, God, are our peace. And your peace surpasseth all understanding. So Lord, allow us to hold on to your word and to absorb it. Allow us, God, to see you even through creation. Allow us, God, to look at life and look at the even critical issues through a lens, not of fear, because you haven't given us a spirit of fear, but of faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. May God bless you and may have a smile upon you. Thank you for sharing this time with us. God bless. Get that music.